Welcome to The Read Along. A mini book club for your ears. I'm your host, Scott. I'm your other host, Anita. And join us on a journey through a good book, one one chapter chapter at a time. time. Do you like talking about movies? Do you like talking about mediocre movies? Do you like talking about how you could have fixed mediocre movies? Well, I certainly do, and you can listen to me, Scott C. Bourgeois, along with my co-hosts Greg Beaver and Liam Kreswick, as we give our notes, and I have some notes. You can follow it now on your podcatcher of choice, or support it by visiting patreon.com slash I have some notes. Getting into December, as we finish up this book. Yeah. Which means that the decorating has begun, the Christmas music has begun to play in the stores. Getting into that holiday spirit. We were almost Whamageddon. I was almost Whamageddon twice. Yeah. Ugh. For those of you unfamiliar with Whamageddon, because <laughs> I cannot presume you all know, uh, it's just a silly online thing where uh, while you're out and about between December 1st and December 24th, you're trying not to hear Wham's Last Christmas. <laughs> yes. Uh, and if you do, you've been you've failed Whamageddon. Yeah, you've you failed at Whamageddon. But covers don't count. And we've heard two covers of it, but not the original song. Well, I heard the original song, but it wasn't yet December 1st. Right. So I was okay there. And then while we were out shopping for our new book, I might add, We heard a cover of it, and we panicked for a second, and then we realized we were okay. Yeah, that's just a thing. I actually have gone a couple years without being whammed. Despite, like, going to the mall and going grocery shopping, like... I usually get caught. It usually snags me somewhere. I think maybe one Christmas I've gone without. No, well, it's been a couple years for me. Oh, good job. So I probably do. (laughs) Oh, no. But, uh, you know, we have a friend who unfortunately heard it literally on the 1st of December, like the moment they went out. Oh, that's disappointing. Yeah. Just started out the season here in Wham's last Christmas. To be fair, now, though, the rest of the holiday, stress-free. Stress-free. Don't have to worry about it. You're already out. Doesn't matter what goes into your ears now. Yeah. So uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can just, like, look online. Just search Wham again. You'll find the rules. <laughs> it, but I, I pretty much succinctly covered them. I think so, too. Yeah. It's so. a simple game. Indeed. Anyway, we should talk about our book now. Indeed. And we should get into it because it is our full book club episode of our current novel. Yes. So uh, let's just dive right in. Grab your, your wine and, and your snacks. snacks. Yes. As we do our final analysis of The Winds Are Not by S.J. Bennett. So I guess first question first, did you like this book? I did. I loved this book. I kind of figured you would. Oh, this is my cup of tea, pun intended. I uh, was the one who found this book at the bookstore and immediately was like, I think Anita is going to like this premise. Yeah. He presented it as an option. I was like, ooh, (laughs) I want the detective queen. That I knew was going to tickle your fancy. I Again, and I, I said this earlier on in our discourse about the book, one of the first chapters we were discussing. I recognize that there is a discussion right now around the monarchy, uh, especially since the Queen's passing, that it is controversial (laughs) Uh, in many places around the world, that there is obviously an unfortunate history involving the British Empire and the rest of the world. Cough, cough, colonialism, cough, cough. That said, I, I knew that this would tickle your fancy, and I'm glad that it did. So Yes. If we take a moment to separate uh, art from reality, I enjoyed this book very much as an interesting take on a detective novel. Yeah, for sure. Right? The Queen doing a Miss Marple. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I liked it a lot. Quite so. Okay, so standard question out of the way next. What was your favorite part and your least favorite part? Hmm... My favorite part of the novel wasn't like a specific story beat or chapter or something. It was more like... Um, That's okay. It was more more like part of the structure of the novel. Okay. I did like that we got several point of view characters throughout the book. We got to see things from the Queen's eyes. We got to see things from Rosie's eyes. We got to see things from McLaughlin's eyes. We even got to see things from some of the suspect's eyes. Yeah. And it was interesting because it, it made it a fun part of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. I did like that. How oh, about I you? I see it. My favorite parts, I have two uh, equally tied, and they're both fun 
uh, character beats. One was when the queen won 50 pounds in a Tesco gift card. Which is an actual thing that happened. I know. It amuses me to no end, and I can't entirely explain why. And uh, the second part was Rosie basically defending herself by attacking first on the train. Yeah. And just giving that thug what for. There was a crazy satisfaction in that. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Those were my those were my two favorite parts. I love sure. them the most. Okay. What about a least favorite part? Um, I don't think that there was anything that particularly egregiously stood out at me in this one where I was like, mm, I didn't care for that. There were a few parts where things slowed down, I feel maybe a little too much from the mystery. From a scholarly perspective, I understand why those beats are in there. Yeah. Uh, and why the author felt the need to have those character moments. I just felt like I wanted more of the mystery. But that's totally subjective. Yeah, I get yeah, that. that's fair. Yeah, I didn't actively dislike anything in this book. Yeah, same I enjoyed with me, it yeah. all the way through. So on the rankings, right? I think our second visit with Masha was probably my least favorite part because it was a lot of time spent on her problems that had nothing to do with our story. Not really. And again, it's, I even mentioned last chapter, that's a plot thread that was left hanging. Yeah. We never get a resolution to that. We and can infer, but we don't get anything concrete. Yeah, exactly. And even if it's my least favorite part, like, I didn't hate reading it. I didn't get to the end of that chapter and be like, ugh, not at all. Like, it was an interesting read. It just had nothing to do with our story. Yeah. And so I was like, eh. I mean, we've read stories that had much more egregious cul-de-sacs that oh, yes. we still enjoyed. So <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so basic stuff out of the way. And before we dive into anything deeper, I just want to acknowledge how well titled this book is. Yeah, it's witty. Yeah, it's got layers, <laughs> <laughs> if you will. Like, it's called The Windsor Knot. It happens at Windsor. It's a convoluted mystery. It's a convoluted mystery. There is literally a knot as part of the mystery. Yeah. Right? Because and of, of course, The Windsor Knot is one of the ways that you tie your tie. Yeah, a very formal, right? Yep. Because we're dealing with royalty. Like, it's... So perfectly titled. I love it very much. Yes, kudos to S.J. Bennett for that title. <laughs> for a very good title. And I realize that that is a superficial thing and blah, 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 extra story. But I appreciate a good play on words like that. Sure. Let's get into, let's get in a little deeper. Why do you think the queen solves mysteries? Let's get it. Let's talk about her character for a little bit. Like, she's the queen. Yeah, but isn't, she wasn't. Isn't she busy enough? She wasn't always the queen. And from what we understand, she was Nancy Drewing as like a teenager. She's bright, she's observant, and she couldn't help but solve mysteries. And when she became the queen, she couldn't stop. <laughs> but she recognized that she had to be more clever about it and more discreet about it. Okay, well, no, let's back it up, though, then. She may not have always been the queen, but she's always been royalty. Yeah, but when you're not the queen, you have a lot more freedom. That's true. I just, even as a teenager then, when she was Nancy Drewing it, I wonder why. Because she's clever and <laughs> observant and couldn't help but solve mysteries. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I mean, why does Nancy Drew do it? Fair enough. Yeah, because you, you want to find the truth. Yeah. You want to dig in there and figure out what's going on. I like it. Just, when you're the queen, so busy. <laughs> the, hence why she has assistants helping her. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's talk about the story a little bit more. There's one thing that, that really stood out to me that I wonder if, if it changed, how it would change our reading experience. <laughs> Billy McLaughlin gives the Queen a piece of information that we don't get. Yeah. Right? After he's been followed by the amateurs, he uh, recognizes the plates, mm -hmm. names the embassy to mm -hmm. the Queen. Yeah. And later on... When she's traveling back to Buckingham Palace and has her moment to think, she puts it all together. Yes. I'm wondering if we as readers got the same information, do you think we would have put it together? Maybe. I mean, the information was kind of there because I recall McLaughlin does say that the embassy had Middle Eastern ties. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that the prince was mentioned earlier on in the novel as well. So there's stuff there, but we, because we're lacking some of the context, certainly as non-British people, because we're lacking oh, some of the context, I'm sure, there was no way for us to necessarily fit those pieces until it was spelled out for us. Yeah. Uh, so I will grant that. But we, we still solved the broad outline of the mystery, even if we didn't have all of the particular details. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there was enough there. That's true. We were, I thought, at least you and I, I can't speak for all readers, obviously. Yeah. I think you and I had 
made some leaps of logic that did make sense. Yeah. Like, we were awfully close. Earlier on, we were definitely following some red herrings and stuff. But when I made, like, an official accusation, (laughs) I was pretty close to the mark. You really were. Even without all of, again, the specific details. Yeah. I'm just wondering how much more specific could we have gotten if we had had the same piece of info. I don't think I would have been able to do it. Hard to say. Because I'm not the one who needs to piece together the mystery. I'm happy to just let it unfold in front of me. Fair enough. I like trying to solve the mystery. I know you do. And I appreciate that about you. All right. So now let's take a step back and look at it from like an outside eye. Why do you think S.J. Bennett chose the queen as a protagonist, as a detective? Because the queen's a fascinating figure. Agreed. It's a crazy fun twist to pick a real life person, arguably a historical figure. Well, at this point, actually a historical figure. Like, even if it's recent history, right? Like, Queen Elizabeth II, pretty famous. Yep. Right? Probably one of the most famous people in the world. And to do such a fascinating twist on it and make her a detective solving mysteries in her own castle. I love it. I think it's very clever. And I think the mystery put she put together is very clever because of it. Because she has all of these character and real life limitations to put on this mystery. Like it forced a bunch of creativity, which I appreciated. Uh, another interesting limitation that gets put on the character when your detective is also the monarch, especially when we learned that she does all of these things in secret. That's the extra layer that she needs to fight through. That's something that uh, a Mr. Holmes never had to deal with, was actually solving the mystery in secret and making it look like someone else had done it. Yeah, it's a smart little twist. It's a, it's a streak of creativity that I really, really appreciate. Because not only does she have to solve the mystery, she then has to figure out how to get that solution out there without it pointing back at her. And Eileen even teases earlier on that it's it's something special to watch happen. Oh, yeah. Even reading it, I was like, oh, that's so clever. She just plants seeds. We talked about that all the time in the chapters. Oh, she's just planting a seed here and there and then just waiting for someone to like grow that seed themselves. Yep. It's it's brilliant. I loved it. I didn't know the queen in real life, personally, but this character I adore. Like, say what you will about the monarchy in real life. That is a separate issue to what I am talking about. I am talking about this fictional detective queen in this book. She is a delight. She is surprisingly down to earth for her station. She is very, very smart. And on top of that, very, very clever. I would presume that S.J. Bennett's characterization of the queen has to at least be pretty close to the real thing. I would hope so. Yeah. Because the queen in this book is the kind of queen I would actually want as a monarch. (laughs) Right? Someone who, like, understands people, knows who she is and what she needs to do, and has no illusions about it. It is tricky. Because uh, you don't want to say, I want to have a monarch ruling over me. But at the same time, you like the character as it presented. Yes. And you're like, if if I had to have a queen, this is the queen I would this like to have. This is the queen I would like to have. We're two Canadians sitting in our basement, right? We're, we're pretty separated from the monarchy. I mean, technically, she Tec- is still our, well, and no. now he no. <laughs> is, our, is our titular head of state. Uh, yes. But, like, we don't live in England. I don't consider myself directly under the monarchy. Yeah. Right? Again, Canadians. An entire ocean away, like almost the other side of the planet. I feel I can appreciate the character better than people who do have really strong opinions about the monarchy one way or the other, because I feel removed from that, right? So I don't feel like my opinion of the character is that heavily influenced by real life. Fair. You That's know? fair. Yep. No, I uh, I definitely see where you're coming from there. It's a tricky... Yeah. Thing to talk about. Well, and I don't want to say that anyone is right or wrong either way because I don't have all the information at hand to make a judgment call. You know? I'm not going to tell someone that their opinions are right or wrong. And again, I don't want to talk about the real monarchy. I want to talk about this fake one (laughs) that we read about. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about Rosie. Yeah, our Watson. I liked her a lot. Yes. I thought she was a great Watson. I agree. I think she might be the strongest character in the book, and that's saying something. Quite possibly. Because the book is about the queen detective, mm-hmm. and you're kind of 
paying and, attention to the queen detective, I think Rosie's a better character. Yeah, I I could get behind that actually. Rosie's really well fleshed out, yeah, and she's a good, strong character, like in and of herself. Well, and she's more relatable than the queen, and the reason for that is because the queen is the queen. Yes. Like she, she has a lived experience completely outside virtually everyone on earth. Whereas Rosie's kind of the point of view character who's the outsider who's worked her way into that circle. Yeah. And she's so, got a more every man appeal, right? Yeah. She's not even hoity toity and rich like Sir Simon. No. Nope. Like they joke about it. Oh yeah. She teases him about it. And he's good natured about it, but there's like an underlying truth there. She is the every person who's now hobnobbing with these people who are quote unquote her social betters. Yeah. Because she's earned it. I'm not suggesting she hasn't. But that gives us a better point of view character into that mm -hmm. than the queen who's on top and has been on top forever. Uh, Rosie is considerably more relatable. Exactly. Because yeah. of it, I think is what you're trying to get at. And I really do wonder if, in story, if she was hired because of her Watson potential. No, it's not implied that she was, actually. No, well, it may not be implied that she was, but we're not inside the queen's head at that moment. It's true. Um, I'm under the impression she was hired because she was good at being the queen's assistant personal secretary. And the fact that she is a good Watson is secondary to that because uh, well, it might've been the queen. It might've been Eileen. I don't remember at what point it was brought up, but mentions that the assistant personal secretary is regularly tapped to be a Watson, but some of them have been better at it than others. Oh yeah. So I very much believe that that would have been a secondary concern. It just so happens she's good at it. How convenient. Indeed. <laughs> yes. I don't know. As Watsons go, I thought Rosie was pretty great. Yeah, I agree. And she did it in heels most of the time. Most of the time. I appreciate that. I guess that is a good segue into one of Anita's favorite parts of discussing a book. Mm, make that movie. Cast that movie. Yeah! So oftentimes we do cast that movie, but this one's a little trickier because we're dealing with like historical figures, granted, who have been in movies and television oh. shows played by other people. How many times has the queen been depicted yeah. on television or in a movie, right? I wanted to take a step back from that and say, if I was making a movie of this, not like what I think it should probably be, which would be like a BBC series. <laughs> yeah. Like 12 episode series doing the first book and then maybe a second series doing the second book. If I was told, no, you have to make a movie. One feature length presentation. I think I know who I would have direct it. I tap Ryan Johnson. Yeah, you would. He's demonstrated that he can do a Miss Marple style mystery with knives out and glass on you. Oh. And the reason I'm picking him rather than specifying who I'd pick for every role is because those two movies are so well and tightly casted with just an embarrassment of riches of great character actors. I just trust that he'd cast Rosie and McLaughlin and Sir Simon and Masha and Yuri and the all queen. of these, <laughs> all of these characters very well. Like I, I a hundred percent trust him to be able to put together an interesting ensemble for this. Yeah. And so that's kind of why I just, I want to outsource it directly to my director pick on this one. <laughs> trust your creatives. Exactly. Yeah. That's a good way to do it. We discussed it very briefly before we started recording, and I think I might also give a nod to the casting director and or crew, because I'm not sure how they do it, of The Crown, because they seem to do really good casting of, like, the royal family. Yeah. Right? Through the through the ages. I might rope them in to help. Because sure. casting is going to be really important. Yeah, especially right? for, the, for the historical figures. Yeah. And you'd need a budget... Because I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be allowed to film very much in Windsor proper. Hard you to might say. have to build a set of Windsor Castle. Hard to say because the royal household is not at Windsor all the time. No. So you might be able to arrange to film around that. I don't know how the crown was filmed. I didn't look into it. It's possible they were filming at actual locations. It's possible they were filming on sets. But you'd basically do that. Yeah. It's like how if you want to do a show about the United States president, you just use the West Wing set. Yeah, because they rebuilt the White House. Like, pretty much <laughs> spot on. Pretty so, close, yeah. yeah. And since most of it takes place in Windsor Castle or on the grounds. Most of it. Most of it. I think you'd be okay. It's almost like it's a locked room mystery. Kind of. Kind of, except your locked room is an entire castle and every so often the characters leave. <laughs> So, in fact, not at so all. So, not a at all room. a locked room mystery. Yeah. I take it back. Having said that and then thought it out, nope, I was wrong. So, that kind of wraps up 
the wins are not. Yeah. I could honestly, I could talk a lot longer about how much I love this book and I could gush about it for ages, but we're trying to keep our episode to a reasonable length. Yeah. These episodes have a tendency to run a little long and we're, we've are we been trying the last couple books to keep them a little more try, compact. Try. So uh, with the wins are not done though, that means that it's time to get another book. Yeah. And then we did. So we did that. So we did that. Here it is, everybody. The blurb from the back. A magical serial killer is stalking the occult town of Racton. Hypnotic whistling causes victims to chew their own tongues off, leading to the killer being dubbed the Whistler. Original, right? Enter the Undetectables, a detective agency run by three witches and a ghost in a cat costume. Don't ask. They are hired to investigate the murders, but with their only case so far left unsolved, will they be up to the task? Mallory, the forensic science expert, is struggling with pain and fatigue from her recently diagnosed fibromyalgia. Cornelia is suddenly stirring all sorts of feelings in Mallory. Diana is hitting up all her ex-girlfriends for information. And not forgetting ghostly Theodore, deceased, dramatic, and also the agency's first, unsolved, murder case. With bodies stacking up and the case leading them to mysteries at the very heart of magical society... Can the undetectables find the Whistler before they become the killer's next victims? So yes, you'll want to go out to your local bookstore and pick up a copy of The Undetectables by Courtney Smith, which will be our next novel, a fantasy mystery. Okay, I know we just did a mystery and we're going into another mystery. I hope that's okay because this book like it's, looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, Nita was looking for something a little more lighthearted and also uh, fantasy because we wanted to switch up genres. But as genres blend into one another, uh, this one happens to be a fantasy mystery. Yeah. So, And I like a good mystery. We all Clearly, know it. It's true. So yeah, The Undetectables by Courtney Smith. You should be able to find it at your local bookstore. It is a recent publication. It came out this year, so it should be in ready supply. Mm -hmm. The last name is Smith, S-M-Y-T-H. Yes. So you'll uh, just know what to look for. And you'll want to read up on chapter one in time for next week as we dive right into it. You want to know what the selling feature was for this book for me? Sure. The tagline on the front says, be gay, solve crimes, take naps. And I was like, sold. It was one of the two books that we were strongly <laughs> considering before we left. So I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, so you'll want to, again, read up on that in time for next week. And of course, as always, in the meantime, you can give us a little rating and review on your podcatcher of choice. We appreciate those so much. Yeah. You can also reach out to us on social media. Absolutely. We are on X, formerly known as Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Goodreads, and now Blue Skies. Blue yes. Sky. Singular. Blue Sky. Yes. I'll get it right. Uh, we are at the read along at pretty much all of those yeah, you I can think find so. us by looking us up uh, you can also send us an email yes we are the readalong at gmail.com and with that said as always we love you very much and we'll see you next time new book Thank you for joining us on The Read Along with your hosts, Anita and Scott Bourgeois. All Read Along music is by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Cover art is by Aaron Beaver. Be sure to join us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Read Along and check out our group on Goodreads.com.